Welcome back to the Personal Injury Law Show, viewers. Before the break, we're talking about a matter of Thornton and Sweeney, where the learner driver is suing the supervising driver. Now, what happened in this case in court, Don? Well, it, this, so this is a scenario where you've got the learner driver who is driving and then obviously the, suing the supervisor Blaming failing the to instruct. Blaming the supervisor so that's different to, to instruct. Embry. Yes, yes. Ultimately, the court held at first instance, so the first judge said that the uh, supervisor was liable for failing to instruct properly and it was to do with what speed to take that corner. Uh, that was appealed to the New South Wales Court of Appeal, I think it was three judges, and unfortunately for the plaintiff, the, plaintiff the lost. driver, the plaintiff lost. Yep. And it was on the basis that the supervisor took all precautions and for failing to instruct, uh, looking at the speed, the corner, what was going on, they just said, look, it just wasn't there. Just, just on that point, Don, Rob, there was a lot of reconstruction of evidence in relation to speeds. There was a huge amount. They got expert evidence from two or three experts. They were saying, at what speed would it have been safe to enter this bend? How fast exactly were they going? Were they accelerating when they went into the, the fish tailing? Were they braking? What effect was that happening? What were the undulations in the road? And ultimately, what the judges were saying was, look, from the perspective of the supervisor, how could he possibly take all that into account? At a basic level, they were driving 30 k's below the speed limit. What did the courts find that the speed, what was the speed? Did they come uh, to a conclusion? Ultimately it was 70 kilometres per hour, uh, which roughly. was 10 kilometres less than the per uh, permissible speed limit of a learner driver in New South Wales, and it was 30 kilometres less than the uh, permissible speed limit on that road. Well, it's not, that's not even relevant because the law does say, even though you've got 100 kilometres an hour, you still got that's to take right. precautions if it's unsafe. It's and great. the road was wet. The road was wet. They took that into account, but also the, the corner did not have any signs to warn the driver or anyone of oh, slowed down. so that's probably an issue of Vic, not Vic roads, but New South Wales roads or mm. the local council. That's correct. But what happened in the end? What did the High Court do? Uh, it didn't go to the High Court that Thornton and Sweeney. It just went to New South Wales Court of Appeal. I don't think it's been appealed to the High Court, but the New South Wales Court of Appeal just said the plaintiff lost. So in other words, she, at first instance, she was awarded Five million dollars. After the court of appeal got involved, she got zero dollars, Tony. What do you think of the decision, Rob? Well, look, I do sympathise with the with the learner driver, but ultimately, if you put yourself in the shoes of the supervisor, looking at the circumstance, I mean, it would have been very difficult for him to know that he had to warn this driver to go down, you know, ten kilometres and take it at a certain way. The angle just—it's yeah, very but difficult. Yeah, you're talking about goes. a very experienced trainer and someone that's trying to learn how to drive. Oh, I think it's a bad decision. Yeah. Tony, what's interesting, at the first the trial, the first trial, um, the supervising driver did not give evidence. Yeah, look, I, I find it extraordinary. And the, the judge didn't like that, I think, at first instance. Yeah, well, the inference is there, you know. Strong. He's not put in a box by the defendant for the simple fact that he can't help their case. Well, that's right. That's look, right. I, I think it's a poor decision. I would have thought a, a more satisfactory result would have been 50-50. Mm. Potentially, yeah. I would have anyway, let's go to the next case, because time flies, as we all know. This is an interesting case involving Mount Panorama, James and Whiteman. Can you give us the facts of this case, Rob? Yep, this matter here concerns, uh, it's not actually a motor vehicle accident, it involves a motor, uh, sorry, a bicycle. <clears throat> now, in this case, uh, there was an event at Bathurst, there was a big motor, you know, GP event. Yeah, it was a Bathurst 5. That's right, that's yeah. right. And uh, at the end of the day, they basically opened up the track to all the spectators, so all the fans can go and have a bit of a walk around and basically see the track and see where all the riders have been. So they get out there, and uh, we have the plaintiff who's there with his family, they're going for a wander. By this stage, it's getting pretty dark. As they're wandering along, uh, this bike comes screaming down the hill at high speed, and then basically collects the plaintiff and knocks him onto the ground. He sustained some pretty significant injuries. Can I stop you there for a minute? You say he was come screaming down the hill, but the evidence was that he's either doing 70 k's or 30 k's. There was so much conjecture about speed. In the end, the judge said it was not relevant. That's right. The judge said it wasn't relevant because the, the, the road was open for the public and the cyclists had to take care and it was dark and it was coming down even if it was doing 30, 70, whatever. It's irrelevant. It's, it's irrelevant. The judge said that he should have been taking care because he knew there was people on the track. That's yeah. right. It, it, the track was just full of people and they were walking around the track to look at the accident sites and see where the corners were and all those things. And he just came down and sustained quite significant injuries. He got some shoulders injuries which affected his work capacity and all that time. He was a labourer, this fellow, so he relied on, you know, the ability to do heavy work to be able to work and, he and didn't earn have an the income. education to do something at a no, desk. No, he wasn't educated at all. But he, he had a very good work history 
And uh, what did the court do in this case, uh, Rob? Ultimately, they granted him his damages uh, on the basis that uh, he wasn't really doing anything wrong in the circumstances. I mean, the track was open to the public. He was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing, and the bike rider should have been taking a lot more care when he was coming down that hill. Yeah. And how much were the damages? Around, uh, I believe it was around half a million dollars, Tony. Yeah, I think it was a bit more than that, Don. And there was a Leon spray for past. Close to yeah. There was past loss involved. There was uh, cost, future. cost of future care. Yeah. There was uh, loss of income past, present and the future. Yeah. Pain and suffering was, was pretty uh, high. But yeah, it was just to split up quickly, it was a pain and suffering was 120 and the rest was made up of income loss and also some future medical expenses which in New South Wales they can recover. And also the so care, there was also some costs associated with care. Yeah, so it was, and, five, uh, it was, it was just about half a million, $550,000. So and interestingly, Tony, there was no reduction here for contributory negligence. Well, they found I don't think they should have been. completely in the right. Well, and, and you know what's really surprising? Thank God this happened in a confined space because once again, the story about identification, if this cyclist had got up and taken off, who would you serve? There'd be no way to identify him. And what about insurance? Is there insurance? Well, I think, I don't know. That's a, must have insurance. Why would you go through all this, Tony? Okay. Uh, obviously okay. they're not covered by the compulsory third party right. schemes. So I think so. Okay. But uh, bike riders, bear in mind that in Victoria, there's an association and you register with them, and for a very small amount of money, probably $150, you can insure for your own damage and for any other people you might come to grief with. So please take out insurance. Just quickly, let's get on to this case of Robson and Gould. What are the facts, Rob? This is a very interesting one, Tony. This concerns a soldier who was coming home, I think, from the barracks at the end of the day. Uh, she was riding her motorcycle, and she still had her military fatigues on. She was wearing camouflage. Now, another car was coming through an intersection and had to give way to her. Failed to give way. Failed to give way, that's right. Didn't see her and uh, basically just collected her. Mm. Now, his argument was that uh, she wasn't visible. Wasn't visible because of camouflage, Tony. What happened, Don? What well, the judge do? well, it wasn't visible because of camouflage and wasn't visible because of the headlights. And it was 5.30 sunny day, so I'm not sure why that was a factor. But in any event, the court found for the plaintiff, uh, didn't, didn't accept the argument about the camouflage, because she uh, just camouflaged into this, to this um, scenery. John, and just to stop you for a minute. What the judge did, what she did say in evidence was that she normally has her headlights on, depending on weather conditions. That's right. Yeah. Now, on this day, like you rightly said, Don, it was sunny. Why would you have your headlights it was, it on? It was March, 5.30, why would she have her headlights yeah, on? It's just, the judge took 7.5% off her, Tony. I think he just did it for the sake of doing it. What do you think, Rob? Well, yeah, I think he just seemed to think perhaps that under the circumstance would have made her a bit more visible, but again, okay. it's... Yeah, well, she got paid that. out, she got her pun and suffering, got loss of income, she got loss of housing because there was allowances made for people in yeah. the RAF, yep. and uh, she got looked after by the and court. Even a significant contribu um, contribution to a super, which is paid at a higher rate than a normal 9%, Tony, so it's, she ended up getting nearly $850,000. Well, fellas, time flies as usual. I want to thank you for coming on board, Rob. Thanks, Tony. And uh, I want to thank the viewers for watching. We're going to a sponsor break so please stay tuned we're going to come back with the mailbag thank you